Ontario Diagnostic Days 2022 on realagriculture.com is brought to you by the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, the University of Guelph Ridgetown Campus, Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association, Grain Farmers of Ontario, Agris Co-op, BSF Canada, Bear and Decal, Corteva and Pioneer, Great Lakes Grain, Mazex, The Mosaic Company, Pride Seeds, and Syngenta. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin. Welcome to Ontario Diagnostic Days, Day 2. On this episode, we're going to share two presentations that we filmed during the infield event back in July at University of Guelph's Ridgetown campus. We'll kick things off with Omafra Soybean Specialist Horace Bonner and Agriculture and Agri-Food Research Scientist Owen Wally. They'll focus on soybean seed quality issues and how to identify and diagnose problem seed. We'll then talk Western Bean Cutworm with University of Guelph Research Associate Yasmin Farhan. She'll share some great insights on what researchers are learning about how best to control this pest. Again, CEU credits are available for diagnostic days. For this episode, we've embedded the QR code in the video. You'll see it as you watch. Here's episode two. So we're here at Diagnostic Days today looking at soybeans to assess their quality because last fall it was kind of a wet, wet uh, harvest season for a lot of us and that really can reduce seed quality. So it's easy to look at a textbook and see a picture and think you know what that disease or issue is. It's sometimes a lot harder to actually have a sample in front of you and assess what it is. So what we've done here is we've set out various different little petri dishes with samples of different problems. And now people are going through and looking at them trying to decide what the issue is. And now we're going to discuss what we've seen in our careers and this is not a, a, an exclusive or a complete list these are just some of the things we're going to talk about today so the first one right now is green seed mature green seed which is really an odd kind of bean seed to look at because of course beans are supposed to be yellow right and what happens is if the August, if August or August and September are extremely dry, the enzyme in there will kind of dry up and the chlorophyll won't be digested. And so that chlorophyll remains in the seed and it can be just on the inside or it can be on the outside of the seed. And of course, the problem with it is when that seed goes to the crusher, the Chlorophyll gets into the oil and it makes the oil go rancid so we get downgraded if there's a lot of green seed in the sample. So that's the first one. The other thing is in terms of germination and vigor, we've observed and studied that both of those go down significantly, 20 and 40 percent respectively, um, if the green is throughout the whole seed. The other thing that's worth noting is that green does not go away in storage. It, it's dec it declines a little bit, one or two percent, but it doesn't go, go away. Okay, that's the first thing. Now let's look at the second idea here. This is one where the seed actually turns brown and you can see that right where the hilum is, uh, sometimes there's this brown ring and what happens is that the pod opens up a little bit and that disease enters and infects the seed. Now, if you think about the fall as soybean plants mature and yellow, of course, from the bottom, you'll often see this, these brown lesions 
and uh, it almost looks like brown spot, but it's not, it's alternaria. So what I'm talking about now is alternaria, and Owen, you've made the comment that alternaria is present pretty much everywhere, right? Yeah, alternaria is going to be fairly ubiquitous. It grows saprophytically on any material that's left in the field. It can cause minor infections on the leaves, and uh, if weather conditions and environmental conditions are correct, high enough humidity, it will enter into the pods and then start infecting the seeds. Uh, this can lead to issues with germination, um, but for the most part, you're going to find almost n over 90% of all the beans that you check will have alternary to some degree or mm. the other. Whether or not it's problematic is not always the case. Yeah, and I think that's the key, right? It's the fact that a small amount, you can't even see it, no one cares. It's when we get into these wet falls that you might have enough to even make their seed brown like we're observing right here. Yeah, right? absolutely. It causes big, can cause some severe issues on the germination side in the spring. Okay, so what about the next problem? Okay, so the next one is fairly obvious and most people will probably be able to determine that that is white mold. So it's caused by sclerotinia. Um, basically what it causes, it can cause problems on the seed, basically by shrinking the seed. But the main issue with white mold is when it infects it in the field. So you'll see these uh, vegetative bodies, these uh, storage structures called sclerotia, which kind of resemble uh, rat droppings. Uh, these will overwinter in the field and they can last for many years within the field. When these start to germinate, when you get high humidity and lowish temperatures under about 20 degrees Celsius for over 24 hours is they'll start to germinate and then release their spores into the air. These spores are not very strong so they're actually fairly weak and they need senescent tissue in order to start an infection. So that senescent tissue it's usually going after is going to be flowers uh, at the end of their flowering period uh, usually around R3 growth stage uh, into R4 and what that ends up happening is it'll start to cause these small infections which can further spread because once it starts the infection is the mycelium can be extremely aggressive. So when you see it in the field as you'll see areas or circles within the field where you have these outbreaks. Uh, this is more of a problem when you have narrow rows or very high levels of vegetative growth just because it adds this under canopy which can uh, result in more and more uh, moisture present and then that spreads from plant to plant as they're closer together as well. And, qu and quite regional too, right? Like I know some growers in eastern Ontario, boy, they seem to get it almost every year and, and basically they're almost spraying uh, every year regardless of whether or not they have the weather because they know the weather will come and they'll have it anyway, right? That kind of, a, is, is, and, and that, that raises the question, Owen, you know, how do we decide whether we should spray for white mold or not. It's not that easy, right? It's not, but what you need to do is look at the stage of your plants, how okay. much growth there is. So if they're growing very vigorously, so right now in late July, if they're up past your knee, is it's gonna be a better chance that you're gonna to need to spray those versus the ones that are just up to your shin at this point. Uh, then you have to look at the weather forecast, whether or not there's gonna be um, high levels of rain or humidity, cooler temperatures in the evenings. And then that can really dictate when it's going to spray. So we're typically going to be spraying one or two times during the season, and it really depends. So if you have the smaller beans, you're probably more likely to go to one spray or no sprays. And if you have larger beans and a history of white mold within the field, and that's important. So if you have white mold one year and you have similar conditions in another year, you're likely going to get it as well. And then that can cause pretty severe uh, yield losses and reduction in seed quality as well. Um, the next one we'll talk about is Fomopsis, which is another fungus that causes the seeds to shrivel. It kind of has this chalky-like texture on the outside of, this, of the seeds. Uh, and the main issue with this is it can cause picks or loss of uh, quality of your bins of yeah. seed. And for anyone who's using it for seed production, is the vigor goes way down with Fomopsis. So it causes this cracking, drying, and depending on what stage of the filling or the seed filling as the infection comes in and like most of these other ones we talked about is this is mostly seed diseases it's usually due to delayed harvest mm, usually yeah, you'll get high humidity yeah, yeah. and the reason you're delaying harvest is usually the field is wet and then that wetness can just mm. transfer up into the seed and then cause more and more of the disease there's not all that much to do with 
you can do about this. Uh, some of the white mold seed treatments can, or not seed treatments, some of the white mold sprays can help uh, reduce the Phomopsis. And then in terms of planting the seed the following year, as long as the damage is not too severe, is that a lot of the uh, fungicidal seed treatments can improve the stand and uh, germination. But certainly it was a pretty significant issue in specific areas and fields last year with, with what uh, weather we had, right? Again, that, that, that wet fall. Uh, but to your point, overall, do you think we're seeing more or less of that disease in Ontario? From what I've heard, is becoming less and less prevalent. Interesting. Probably interesting, due yeah. to genetic improvements within the soybean varieties yeah, that have yeah. just a little bit more tolerance to them. Yeah, that's and it could be people gr growing slightly earlier or just weather conditions yeah, changing yeah, to get yeah. the crops off earlier. Or maybe earlier planting, someone suggested yeah, as well. Also true. Yep. So the next one we've got here is, is really a fascinating one because it can be caused by, the symptoms at least, can be caused by a few different. Uh, environmental or in this case a virus right a virus so this first one here is soybean mosaic virus and that is one that we've known about for over a hundred years and it is spread all around the world and can cause some pretty significant issues aphids also carry it from plant to plant visually at this time of year the leaves may actually look similar to, um, it, the, the symptoms may look similar to a hormone type of herbicide, puckering, curling, uh, even that little bit of blistering, shortened plants. And then in the fall, when you get the combine in there, you'll see symptoms of streaking and mottling from the hilum down. And the way to think about that is, of course, the hilum is where the, seed is attached to the pod and that hilum has pigment in it a color and that color can wash out um, sometimes it can happen even without any virus present if it's a wet fall and ip growers are quite worried about that because of course then we have downgraded seed and that's just called hilum bleeding but in this particular sample, this was caused by soybean mosaic virus, okay? And then we also have bean pod model virus, which is very similar. In fact, you can't visually distinguish the two by looking at the, the seed. You have to uh, send the samples to the lab and they'll be able to tell you what, which virus you've got. But visually, the symptoms are very similar. That's streaking, and the amount of streaking really depends, and the color depends on the variety and the, inf the amount of infection. So generally speaking, um, we are less worried about bean pod model virus because it's transmitted from plant to plant only uh, by the bean leaf beetle, and we have less of that around the world than we do of soybean mosaic virus. But generally speaking, if I can just kind of sum the virus soybean hilum bleeding issue up, most Ontario growers think about planting their IP beans early, relatively speaking, so that they can get them off fairly early and avoid those fall wet dry cycles because that's when you get that bleeding which is a, is a problem. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Okay, so the next one we're going to talk about is kind of obvious, just based on the coloring. This is purple seed stain caused by Sarcophspora. So basically we'll have discoloration of the bean where the fungus came in and infected it. Uh, this species of Sarcophspora can also cause Sarcophspora leaf blight, which is seen kind of around early August into late August, where we'll start to see starting off as kind of bronzing of the leaves, and then that expands further into kind of the leaves turning completely purple uh, in some severe cases. This can cause some yield diff issues, but for the most part, it is uh, generally uh, tolerable. Uh, the bigger problem is when it actually gets into the seed, and this is usually due to delayed harvest again. Mm, right. So you're going to have more moisture in the field, you're going to have the disease spreading. Um, so this is particularly important again in the IP beans because you're going to get mm. the color is a little more important than in the crushing beans where uh, it's not nearly as important. Um, uh, generally favorable under these warm wet conditions. Um, there is some 
fungicides that can be useful. Uh, however, they are resistant, or the large portion of them are resistant to the estrostrobins. Uh, and this is just a natural mutation within the Cercospor species. And we did some analysis last year where almost over 90% of the isolates that we looked at contain or, or were insensitive to the astrostrobins. Right, right. So some of the other uh, uh, fungicides that can be applied at the same time as for white mold can add some uh, reduction in the disease symptoms. Um, but the big issue again is going to be in uh, seed quality for when they're replanting the seed the following year. So you could have poor germinations, poor stands. So there is some of the uh, general uh, uh, general uh, fungicidal seed treatments can improve on this germination of these seeds. So really we just kind of try to avoid that in particular into the IP beans as best as right, we can right, and right. use a suitable seed treatment. All right, um, the next one we're going to talk about is uh, is a little bit different. It's not caused by a fungus, it's actually caused by oomycete, hmm. which are closely related to fungi, but they're also related to algae. And being that, it's called downy mildew caused by Piranosporum. Um, this can affect the seed, cause these dull colorings of it, and but the main impact is going to be when it's actually infecting the leaves, especially under the again these warm kind of humid conditions. Um, so you'll see these light yellow lesions, small. They start off small and they can expand. Uh, you'll see this on the top side of the leaf, and then when you flip it over, you'll see this fuzzy uh, mycelium coming off the bottom of that lesion. That's how you can tell right away that it is downy mildew. Uh, one of the bigger problems with downy mildew is again in these IP beans in the fact that it's, it's, uh, it's a registered pathogen and the fact that it, it uh, needs to be quarantined and some mm. of these harvests can be docked or rejected based on high levels of perennisporum. They just aren't wanting these to go into different countries if they're not already present there. So I think if we wrap it up in terms of the seed quality issues, Fall harvest is so important, timely harvest. If we can just get those beans off, and I know, you know, the weather is a big challenge, but that is, that is so crucial so that these diseases and some of these other issues don't impact the seed. And the other thing, you know, that we haven't maybe hit on too much is the fact that some of these diseases, especially if we're planting uh, soybeans that are going to seed, a foliar fungicide can really reduce the, the, the impact, right? It can improve yes. the quality of the seed. That's what I'm trying to say, improve the quality of the seed. Isn't that fair for some of these? Yeah, absolutely. For, for seed producing, try to get planted as early as you can so you can get it off harvested as early as you can. And using appropriate time fungicides based on weather conditions and just what's expected and hopefully you can get it off early enough. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, again, thanks everybody. Uh, and and it, it's, it's been really interesting to look at all these samples and, and recognize that there's, there's quite a few things out there that uh, can cause us grief. All right, Western bean cutworm is a pest of corn and dry edible beans. It first came to Ontario in 2008 and has become a major pest of corn since then. It has one cycle a year, we call that univoltine, and the moth is easy to identify. They have two white stripes on either side of their body with a circle and a crescent on either side of the wing as well. The moths come around uh, July, beginning of July, and peak flight happens mid to um, or uh, late July into the beginning of August. Females will lay eggs in clusters of 15 to 50 eggs and those eggs will transition from white to tan and then purple. At that purple stage, the larvae will soon hatch and start their movement cycle. Larvae will travel up towards the tassel and feed on the pollen and then transition down towards silk where they'll feed on the silk and beginning of the developing ears. And then there's a third larval movement. This is done by the uh, larger instars where they start moving from plant to plant or down to the soil where they'll start overwintering. They will overwinter as prepupa and they'll create a, a cocoon underground to protect themselves from, from the winter conditions. The following year, the uh, prepupa will pupate around May to June and the cycle will continue. Western bean cutworm was originally found in the great US 
uh, plains, but have expanded its range into Ontario and can be found as far east as Nova Scotia and the Maritime Provinces. Now let's talk about management of western bean cutworm. You have three options when thinking about management of western bean cutworm. First, you could do nothing. Next, you could apply insecticides. And then the third is the use of transgenic traits. Now we'll talk about insecticides and the options that you have available to you. We have five products that we can use and rely on for uh, Western Bean Cutworm management. Those are Corrigen, Matador, Volume Express, Delegate, and Intrepid. There are other products that are registered, but the chemistries uh, for the active ingredients are represented here. For the most part, uh, these products had great residual activity um, and they continued to provide great mortality up to seven days after application where we started to see a decrease in the effectiveness of Delegate and Intrepid. By 14 days after application, all insecticides dropped in their effectiveness but Corrigin and Volume Express continued to provide adequate control. We took these residual activity mortality data and created a simulated management scenario that is more appropriate for, West, uh, for Ontario growers. We first looked under ideal conditions where a grower goes into a field and scouts for egg masses. They find they're at threshold and go ahead and apply. They use any one of these products and find by one to two days after application, the western bean cutworm that were in their field are now dead and they do not have to follow up with any other management options. Next, we looked at a more typical scenario that's faced by Ontario corn growers. This is where you go into your field, you scout for egg masses, but the, um, the egg mass threshold continues and you continue to have uh, eggs in your field for up to seven days after. So you first apply your insecticide and there continues to be uh, egg laying and we find that there is some survivorship that's happening with all these products but a quite low rate and by 14 days after application all insecticides provided 100% control except for Intrepid which had about 5 to 10% survivorship. In Ontario's hotspots, talking about Norfolk and Bothwell, we find that these growers are faced with an additional challenge where they are at threshold and apply their insecticides, but there continues to be a bombardment of egg masses that are being laid in their field. In this situation, we again start to see a greater survivorship on all of these insecticides, but by seven to eight days after application for all insecticides except Intrepid, we found 100% mortality. Again, Intrepid showed around 10% survivorship. When we're looking at preemptive spraying, where, insectic where insecticides are applied before the threshold is reached, around 1%, we, we start to see a, a bigger division between the effectiveness of these products by the time that threshold is reached. In these situations, again, by seven to eight days after application, all of the insecticides uh, provided adequate control with near zero, if not complete zero, uh, survivorship, except for Intrepid, which again had survivorships around 10%. In uh, preventative scenarios where a grower applies their insecticides without scouting, we saw an even bigger division and a greater survivorship in these products. Um, under situations where the grower applied insecticides three days after application, we found um, the uh, grower ended up wasting these three, um, these, uh, uh, three days where there were no egg masses, where they could have caused a great deal of mortality. And by 14 days after application, although we saw near zero uh, survivorship on the other products, Intrepid had 20 or greater percent survivorship. In a situation where a grower applied insecticide seven days before a mass threshold was reached, we found greatest uh, survivorship with all products having survivorship at 14 days after application and Intrepid having over 60-65% survivorship. This is a great deal of survivorship when we're concerned about mycotoxin contamination in the field. So let's move on and talk about the management of western bean cutworm using BT traits. We currently have only one product that is uh, available to manage western bean cutworm and that's VIP3A. 
Originally, we had Cry 1F, which showed some management um, against some management options against Western bean cutworm. However, resistance developed quite quickly within three years. So our biggest concern with the use of transgenic traits is the development of resistance. To counteract the development of resistance, we have three strategies that we like to deploy. The first one is the high dose refuge strategy, where the VIP trait would be uh, exposing the insects to high doses of the VIP product, and then a refuge plant would then uh, support a susceptible population. So if any resistant individuals were to come up from the VIP exposure, they would then mate with the more abundant refuge susceptible insect, and the product of that crossing would result in more susceptible insects. The other option that we have is rotating. Rotating your products away from corn if you can, and then if you can't uh, rotate uh, away from corn, perhaps use some insecticides and rotate with VIP and insecticides. And the third one is to monitor as much as possible. When we're monitoring for western bean cutworm, we're walking in the field and we're looking in both our refuge plants and our VIP plants, looking for any unexpected damages. In a structured refuge, uh, we can walk through and we can see uh, a lot of insects and we're expecting some western bean cutworm. In integrated refuge or refuge in a bag, this will become a bit more difficult since the refuge plants are randomly planted throughout the field and it's hard to determine when you're seeing a VIP injury or a refuge injury. Another concern with refuge in a bag is cross-pollination. With insects such as western bean cutworm that feed on the ears, cross-pollination can expose insects that are supposed to be on refuge plants to microdoses of the VIP protein, as well as those that are supposed to be killed by the VIP might be exposed to smaller doses of the VIP due to cross-pollination from the refuge plants. So there you have it. I hope you've enjoyed episode two of Ontario Diagnostic Days. If you have any questions for our presenters, please let us know. We'd love to hear from you. You can put those questions in our comments box on YouTube or look for contact information for each presenter at the end of the video. Our next episode is September 21st. We will see you then. Ontario Diagnostic Days 2022 on realagriculture.com is brought to you by the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, the University of Guelph Richtown Campus, Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association, Grain Farmers of Ontario, Agris Co-op, BSF Canada, Bear and DeKalb, Corteva and Pioneer, Great Lakes Grain, Mazex, The Mosaic Company, Pride Seeds, and Syngenta.